Thank you. So I would like to start off again. In the real world, I guess this is the real world, I guess, but in Alaska, where I'm from, I'm Frank Moore. Down here, I am Frankie. So I think people down here know me as Frankie, so I'm a Frankie Moore. And I appreciate the chance to uh, speak here today. Um, I'd like to start off by praying. Uh, Lord, I just ask so much that you would be with me today. Help me as I'm bringing the message. Give me wisdom. Give me clarity of thought and speech. And Lord, I also lift up my wife, Sandy, who uh, fell and has a broken rib. Lord, I just pray that you give her comfort and help that to heal quickly. And Lord, I just thank you again for the chance to be here today. I just feel grateful. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, who all knows? Anybody here know who I am? No, I guess quite a few. I, I grew up here in Glide. My parents used to own Steamboat Inn. Uh, I started attending school in Glide in the fifth grade in that building right over there that I guess is closed because of asbestos or whatever. Um, that I, I survived. I was in there for, you know. Um, but um, And then I went to junior high school up on the hill there and then high school in, up on the hill. And so I'm very grateful to Glide. Glide has been wonderful to me, and I appreciate this chance to be here today. So today I'm going to be, I'm going to be down here because I can see the stuff better and I can point with my pointer. Now, do I need to turn this on? I it should be on. So let me just, and if, if I want to push the, there we go. So that, that is on. And if I want to do the pointer, how do I pointer it? That thing right there? Yep, perfect. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, so today uh, we're going to be talking about the age of the earth. Uh, we're going to start off by talking about is it important and why is it important? Uh, and then we're going to go into several different things that show that the age of the earth isn't as old is where old it is. Um, and, you know, I'm going to be, t I should have them in order where I like, start from the oldest to the youngest or the youngest, but they're kind of scattered in between. And so when we talk about something that says the earth can't be older than 1.4 billion years, that doesn't mean the earth is 1.4 billion years old. That just, any of these dating processes put an upper limit on the age of something, not a lower limit. Okay, and we, but we'll be showing showing those. So, okay, um, how come it's not advancing? There we go. So, if you walk into a room, you see a burning candle. You know how long has it been burning? And that's kind of what we're going to be discussing about the age of the Earth: is how long has the candle of the Earth been burning? And we'll get into more detail about. Now, I love this uh, little cartoon. Uh, it says six days, yep. Six really, truly really days, yep. Are you sure it says six days? Yep. Well, I wonder why it took so long. <laughs> and that's really the truth. Why did God take six days to create the heaven and the earth? Well, it tells us in Exodus 20, 11, that he took six days to give us a pattern of a work week. There is no other reason why there is a week. The French even tried to make it six days instead of seven. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, that didn't work out very well for the French. Um, but, you know, there is an astronomical reason for the, a day, a month, and a year, but there is no astronomical reason why there is a week. Okay? So... The age of the Earth is actually even a more fundamental problem, fundamental issue than evolution is, because if the Earth is not old, evolution is not has no chance. It has no chance of being true anyway, but it has absolutely zero chance of being true. Um, so when you read in Genesis. Okay, it talks about how God created on day one, day two, day three. You know, so what, do, what does the day really mean? Does it really mean a day? Uh, I mean, you, you know, the, the word day has to be used in, uh, 
context. Now, now it's interesting, the word day is used 2,300 times in the Old Testament, but it's only a question in Genesis. <laughs> Why in the world is that? People don't want to admit that the world was created in six days, okay? Um, so, you know, for, again, the, the word, and same thing in Hebrew, the word day has to be determined by the context. For example, in English, if I say, in my grandfather's day, it took five days to drive from Portland to Los Angeles in the day. Now, some of you may have a car like that, too. I don't know, but, you know. <laughs> okay? Um, but so, in Hebrew, you know, if people say, well, we, I don't really think a day means a day. Well, you can ask them, well, okay, do you tell me when in Hebrew does a day mean a day? Okay? How do you, what is, do you tell me what context it is that says a day is really, truly a day? Okay? And they won't be able to tell you that, or they won't tell you that. Okay? So, if you look in the Bible, whenever the word yom, which is the Hebrew word for day, is used with evening, morning, or a number, it always, without exception, means a literal 24-hour day. So what does God say in Genesis chapter 1? He says, evening and morning the first day, evening and morning the second day, evening and morning the third day, evening and morning the fourth day, evening and morning the fifth day, evening and morning the sixth day, evening and morning the seventh day. I mean, doesn't say it says the sixth day. But. So you think God's trying to say something there? I mean, it could it be... Could it possibly be any more clear? Um, now, this verse, Exodus 20, 11, uh, you know, I grew up, you know, in a Christian home, Christian atmosphere. I believed in God. I kind of believed in Christian, or in creation. But then I got to college, and I got evolutionized. Uh, I, I remember still to this day, the first day of inorganic chemistry, I was given an invitation to atheism. They actually gave an invitation to become an atheist, you know. And, and this was a, the man was a brilliant man, uh, and they and this has nothing to do with inorganic chemistry. He presented the, what's called the Miller Miller Urey experiment, where they had this combination of chemicals and they put electricity through lightning bolts or electricity through it, and it created amino acids. So therefore, we're almost creating life. Uh, and that, you know, that has nothing to do with inorganic chemistry, and it also has nothing to do with getting close to creating life. I mean, they're so far away from that, it's not even, but it, that was him inviting us that there is no God, so you can join me and be an atheist. And so I did. Uh, and I just, you know, I'm so foolish. But then I did get saved, but when I got saved, I was still an evolutionist. I still believed in evolution, believed in an old age of the earth, but then I read this verse, and this verse caused me problems. It says, for in six days, the Lord made heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore he blessed the Sabbath. So that six days, that didn't leave me any wiggle room. And so I thought, you know, well, either the old earth is true, or the Bible is true, they can't both be true. And so I came to point, I believe so much in the old age of the earth, I thought, well, the Bible can't possibly be true, so therefore I'm going to reject the Bible. Well, God is so gracious. Uh, one of the, my work co-workers gave me a series of tapes by a man by Dr. John Whitcomb who wrote the book that kind of started the modern creation movement called the Genesis Flood. And he spoke for uh, five days at a church in, in Anchorage, and in this book, or in this speech, and he's talked, I mean, it just, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. You know, I thought, why have I never heard this stuff? And so it got me to look, and so now I am a biblical literalist. If the Bible says that, that's the truth. Okay? So, anyway, so this word that's used for, that says days in, in uh, Exodus 20:11. What does that word mean? Well, that word is called yamin, and it's the plural form of yam. And it's used 265 times in the Old Testament, and it always, without exception, means a literal 24-hour day. Okay, and who, who wrote Exodus 20:11? That's what everybody says, but what does the Bible say? God wrote that with his own finger in a tablet of stone. 
So there is no question that is what God meant. Okay, there is no question. There is no possibility that somebody made an error and didn't understand God when he was saying that. God wrote it. Okay, so God made the earth in how long? Six 24-hour days, okay? So again, the Bible is inspired, but Exodus 20.11 was inscribed by God, okay? So could God possibly make it any clearer? I, I say the answer to that is no. So when you're looking at something and you're trying to determine something's age, uh, how do you do that, okay? Well, you can look at something, for example, you look at me. Okay, how old am I? Well, I look old, right? Older than me. Okay. So, but how do you really determine how old I am? And you, you kind of can compare me with other people. Well, how do I look? I look much younger than most people. See, right? So, you know, but, you know, you compare how I look with somebody else. Or, but the most accurate way is what? Ask my mom. She can tell you when I was born and how old I am. Or you can find my birth record, unless it's Obama's. <laughs> I'm getting political, I better be careful. I'm sorry about that. Okay? But so a written eyewitness record is the most accurate way of telling how old something is. And do we have an eyewitness record that tells us how old the Earth and the universe is? We do, don't we? Okay? And not only, you know, Jesus actually said is that in the beginning, God created, you know, he created man and woman in the beginning, okay? And so when was in the beginning, okay? If you look at a timeline, okay, some people say, well, you know, again, if the earth is billions of years old and Jesus just, God just created people at the very end of it. Well, but if you look at that, in the beginning, if you look at a timeline, um, it doesn't show very well, but, you know, if... Jesus is talking 4,000 years after the creation, okay? Day six is, I mean, it's right at the very beginning, okay? Now, if the earth was created, you know, the universe created 15 billion years ago in the Big Bang, I mean, man was created at the very, 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 very end, okay? Not even close to the beginning. So, why is the age of the earth important? You know, if the earth is old, death has been here for hundreds of millions of years. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says death is the enemy. It's, it's not how we got here. Death is the enemy. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Okay? So there are two, there are two histories, if you look at the world, there are two histories of death, okay? There is the Bible history, the Bible, you know, God's word says in the beginning there was no death, man sinned, death entered the world, death is now the enemy, in the future, death is going to be done away, and then there will be no death. Now, according to man's opinion, evolution there's always been death. The death has been here forever, is going to be here forever. As long as there's life, there's going to be death. But that's not true. And again, this is the evolution story of death. You know, from, from, because of death, we came from an ape all the way to a man. So death is what brought man's existence. However, creation says that man's actions is what caused death. Now, uh, it, you know, on day, you know, at the end of the creation account, Genesis 1.31, it says, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now, could, this po could it be possibly very good if Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, and they're standing on thousands of feet of fossils that show death and disease and suffering and thorns? When did, when did thorns come about? When God cursed the earth and Adam sinned? You know, all of those things we're under Adam and Eve if the earth is, is old. But that can't possibly be true. If, you know, there, was, there was no death and no disease, no suffering before the sin of Adam. Um, now, if science has proven Genesis 1 to be false, 
are not true, how do you trust John 3.16 to be true? Okay? And, you know, also, how can Jesus rise from the dead? I mean, come on, that's scientifically impossible. So, you know, again, if the earth is 6,000 years old, you can believe the Bible, you can trust the Bible, and it's true. And the, the Bible is very clear. The earth is 6,000 years old or very, somewhere at six to 10,000 years old. Now, one question that I frequently get, uh, you know, I see, I, I can talk for a long time today because it's only 8.30. <laughs> <laughs> So I frequently get asked, you know, you know, if, you know, if God created the universe, who created God? And you're like, ah, I got you, you know. Well, you know, every everything that has a beginning has a cause. Okay. Now the universe had a beginning, therefore the universe had a cause. It had to have a cause. Okay. That God created time. God is out side of time. God has always existed. God had no beginning in time. So therefore, God does not require a cause. God is. He didn't have a cause. Okay. Has anybody else been heard that, heard that statement? Yeah, well, you created God. I got gotcha. you. Know, anybody ever heard that? Yeah, it happens all the time. Okay. Now, when, again, I mentioned this earlier, but when you look at a process that, of trying to measure time, these processes that we're look, going to look at give an upper limit of the time, not a lower limit. For example, if you find a buried treasure with coins of these dates, how long has it been buried? Huh? Anybody want to guess how long it's been buried? Well, you don't know that, do you? You don't know it's been buried. But you know it couldn't possibly have been buried before 1900, right? but you don't know when it was buried, but you know that's the upper limit. It couldn't be any earlier than 1900, okay? Well, that's the same thing with these dating things that we're gonna be talking about. Okay, now this is just a list of some of the processes showing the young Earth. There's only about two or three or four processes that show that the Earth or the universe is old. There are over 100 processes that show the Earth is young. You know, so you just look at things that are going that change with time, and there are just many, many, many of them that will show that the Earth is young. We're going to talk, if we have time, about the ones that are in red. Um, now, one of the questions, I talked about this last year when I was here, is how do we see the light from the stars that are so far away? And I believe the stars are that far away, okay? But does anybody remember how fast is the one-way speed of light? Does anybody remember how fast that is? Huh? That's what people say, it's 186,000 miles per second. However, what's the problem with the one-way speed of light? Does nobody remember it? I talked here last year, didn't I? <laughs> and nobody remembers. It's not possible to measure the one-way speed of light. You can only measure the round trip speed of light. You, the process of moving something to look to get the, you know, to a sensor from here to here to sense the light, how long it takes to get it, changes its clock. Just the process of moving it changes its clock. Okay? And so it is not, Einstein said that in the, when he was doing his theory of relativity. You know, he says, you know, it is impossible to know the, the one-way speed of light. He said, it's called the Einstein uh, assumption. And he says, I'm going to assume that the speed is the same in both directions. But he says it can be, that's just my, that's my assumption. But it can be anything that is impossible to assume, to show that it's not different. So very easily, the speed of light could be infinite coming to us and half the speed of light going away from us. And it's impossible to show that that's not true. So that's what is the one of their speed of light is different in different directions. There's another thing is that if the, the, the deeper you are in a gravity well, and thus if the Earth is at the center of the universe or close to the center of the universe, which I believe it is, 
time goes sl more slowly in a heavy, a dense gravity area than it does far away where the gravity is less. And again, I don't understand all that, but that's, yeah. and it also could be that it's just a miracle of creation. Um, now, the, the, the stars were formed on day four, and they were formed to show si for sign seasons, days, and years on the earth. So therefore, on day four, the light was, came from the stars to the earth. Now, exactly how that happened, I don't know, uh, but it did. Um, so again, there are several possibilities to explain why, how the light gets here. So the evolutionists can't say, well, you know, you can't show how the light got here. Well, I say, you know, there are these possibilities, and as long as there are possibilities, they can't rule them out. Okay? So we're going to talk about the moon. I love, I'm going to just show some pictures of the moon. I, that, can you imagine somebody getting a picture like that? Isn't that unbelievable that somebody can get something like that? We're going to talk about the moon's recession. We're not going to talk about the other ones today. Um, I'm just going to show some pictures here of the of the moon and the Earth. Oops, I went too. Well, I messed it up. Um, I'm going in the wrong direction here. So, okay. So on July 21st, 1969, anybody remember that day? Yeah. When they when they landed on the moon, I was driving uh, from Chiloquin back to Steamboat, and I was just about to the summit, uh, you know, coming up 138 from the Highway 97 when the, you know, the eagle was landed. You know, I can just remember, it was kind of late in the afternoon, I mean, it just, it was amazing. Uh, but when they landed, they actually put this sensor, a reflector, on the moon. And they put that on the moon so they could shoot a laser beam up at the moon and bounce it back to the Earth to get a measure of how far, what the distance is to the moon. And what, you know, what they find is that the moon is actually receding from the Earth. And why, why is that happening? Well, it's, um, it, it, the, the reason is, is the Earth is pulling on the moon, and according to the... Um, laws of motion, Newton's third law of motion, if the Earth pulls on the moon, the moon pulls, is pulling back on the Earth. And as it does that, it causes the moon to accelerate in its orbit, and it causes it to slightly, slowly drift away. So if you go back in time, oops, the moon missed the Earth, how'd that happen? Um, but as you go back in time, the, the moon would have been touching the Earth 1.4 billion years ago. And they say, you know, the moon and the Earth are 4.5 billion years old. So right there, you just lost 3 billion years. But also, the moon couldn't possibly be touching the Earth because when it gets, there's something called the Roche limit, which, you know, I think it's, I, I don't remember the distance, but we get to a certain distance from the Earth the gravity causes the moon would cause the moon to just kind of explode. Um, and the other thing is, you see from that graph the blue line. As you go back in time, it actually it becomes exponentially closer. So it's actually receding much faster initially than it is later on. Okay. So again, that's an upper limit of the age of the Earth, 1.4 billion years old, but it's much less than that. So when somebody says the Earth's 4.5 billion years old, you can say, can't possibly be because the moon's going away. Now, we, we talked about that, skip that one. Now we're going, most of the time when I ask somebody, what is the evidence that the Earth is old? People will say, well, carbon dating proves it. Anybody ever heard that? Anybody know why that's a problem? Well, we'll talk about that, but that's not the biggest problem with carbon-14 and giving an age of the Earth and dating rocks. You can't date a rock with carbon-14 because it doesn't have any carbon in it. Okay? Rocks are rocks. They don't have carbon. Carbon comes from life. Okay? So the only thing you can carbon date is something 
that was once a lie, okay? And you really can't carbon date, at least you not used to not be able to carbon date a bone because bones don't have carbon, they're calcium. They've been, you know, supposedly filled in with minerals and, you know, everything, but we'll talk about that later, but how now they actually find soft tissue in bones. They find blood vessels and blood cells and all that, which shouldn't, that can't possibly last more than thousands of years, uh, but we'll talk about that, but you can, you can date those. Uh, but so carbon dating is only good for dating something that's alive has been alive. And that shows, again, we'll show that, that shows the Earth has to be less than 30,000 years old. We'll show that. So this is the kind of a complicated schematic, you know, of, of, of carbon-14. And see if I can kind of get up here and sh see if I can shine the light. So what, what happens, you have cosmic radiation coming from the sun, mainly. And that cosmic radiation hits a nitrogen atom, the nitrogen atom spits out a proton and it actually then it becomes carbon-14. So now you have, and carbon-14 is radioactive and it breaks down back into carbon-12 eventually. Um, now, so carbon-14, carbon in the atmosphere then combines with oxygen to form carbon dioxide, which is supposedly such a bad thing, right? Carbon dioxide is terrible, right? And making the earth heat up, and if we would be dead if it weren't for carbon dioxide. Um, and actually, I don't know if you knew, but civilization has always prospered when the temperature is warmer. Um, does anybody know that they used to grow wheat in Greenland? In 900, in the 900s, they actually grew wheat in Greenland. And then what happened? It got cold, and they had to leave. So is it better to be warm or cold? More people die of cold than they do of heat stroke. Yeah, I can tell you that from Alaska, okay? <laughs> okay. So anyway, and then carbon dioxide is then taken up by plants and all forms of carbon, the carbon-14, carbon-13, carbon-12, all get taken up into plants. Animals then eat the plants and therefore they're eating and ingesting carbon-14. And as long as they're alive, they're eating carbon-14 and the carbon-14 level uh, stays constant. And then when the animal dies, or the organism dies, the plant dies, it no longer is taking in carbon-14. So the carbon-14 starts to break down and there gets to be less carbon-14. Now the current ratio of carbon-12, which is the main, the regular isotope of carbon, and carbon-14 is a trillion to one. So there's a trillion carbon-12 atoms for every carbon-14 atom. So uh, once, so if an animal, as soon as it dies, then right now today, that carbon ratio, the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14 is a trillion to one. Okay, now as time goes on, the carbon-14 gets less, and so that ratio becomes larger. There's more carbon-12 than there is to carbon-14, okay? Does, does that you kind of sort of get a general idea of, and I'm taking longer on carbon-14 than I will on these other things because it's just something that comes up so often, and I just kind of at least try to get an idea of what, what we're talking about here. So. When you're using carbon-14 to date something, you're really not, you are not directly measuring its age. You are measuring the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14. And that can be done very accurately, okay? And, but does that really tell you the age? There, there, you have to always look, when somebody's telling you, you have to think, what are your assumptions? Because the, the devil's in the details, right? Isn't that what they say? So here, you know, most radioactive things are similar to ha an hourglass. Not exactly, because an hourglass is evenly sending the stuff from the top to the bottom, whereas radiometric things are an exponential change. But it's kind of a, the same general idea. You have something on the top the, called the parent that's decaying or changing into something on the bottom that's called the daughter. 
and then the decay rate is how big of a hole you have for it to go through, okay? So the assumptions that you have to make are, you know, one is the decay rate, the rate that that's going through that hole constant, is it the same? The other is you have to say, you have to be able to know the amount that was on the top and was there any on the bottom? Is there something on the bottom that will change you know, the, 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 the age? And then you also have to assume that there's nothing adding anything to the top and there's nothing adding anything to the bottom because that would, again, change it. So here we're going back to our candle, okay? So you walk into a room and you see a candle burning. And you use all your scientific know-how and you're measuring this candle and you're seeing how much and you find out that it's burning an inch an hour and it's four inches long. So how long has the candle been burning? Huh? You don't know how long, do you? Because you, what do you need to know? Okay, that's what you need to know how long it's been burning. What else do you need to know? That's true. And then also you need to know how fast has it been burning? Has it been always burning at the same rate? Let's say somebody put more oxygen in the room. That makes it burn faster. Or if somebody increases the temperature in the room, that makes a candle burn faster. If the wax is different from one spot to another, it changes how fast it burns. So those are things you have to know. You, you, if you walk in to see a candle burn, you have no idea. Maybe it's a taper candle. And so if it's thin at the top, it'll be burning faster up there, and then now you're at the part where it's all even. Okay. So you know you just you, you have to look at the details. You just can't you know, make a quick assumption. So again, you need to know the starting height of the candle, just like you need to know how much carbon fourteen was there to start with. And you have to know has anything changed the decay rate or the burn rate. Okay. So you know these are the starting assumptions. So you have to assume that you know, you know when they're dating with carbon fourteen, they have to say. Okay, well, I know how much the carbon-14 level was when it started. I, 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 we've measured the decay rate. I'm assuming that the decay rate is constant. But you also need to assume that carbon-14 is evenly spread everywhere. And that's kind of a big assumption. The Earth is pretty big. Um, and then you need to assume that no carbon-12 or carbon-14 has been added or taken away from the system. And again, those are things that you don't know because you weren't there when it all started. So this is just kind of an illustration of the half-life, just to give you an idea. I, am I losing people when I say a half-life? Do people understand what a half-life is? A half-life, if you have, so you start out with carbon-14, then you have this much carbon-14 in a vial or whatever, okay? And the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. So if you start out from time zero, <coughs> In 5,730 years, you will have half that amount, okay? And then in another 5,730 years, you have half of that, so you'd have a quarter of the amount that you started with. So then you go to an eighth, to a sixteenth, to a thirty-second, to a sixty-fourth, to seven half-lives, it's a one seven one hundred or one one twenty eight, okay, and so if you start out with a today the carbon twelve to carbon fourteen ratio is a trillion to one, so in this illustration I start out saying well we're a trillion to one is the same as a hundred trillion to a hundred, okay, so in a half life you now have a hundred trillion carbon twelve atoms and in a half life you then now have fifty carbon-14 atoms. In another half-life, you have 25, 12.5. Well, you know, you just keep on going down. So again, it keeps decreasing, but, and that ratio keeps getting larger. So, at present, again, it, the carbon, the ratio is one trillion to one. And as, as time goes on, you know, the, the amount of carbon-14 gets less and less and less and less. 
And in about 10 half-lives, it gets to be so small, you can't measure it anymore. It's too small. I mean, you can say, if you, again, it says a trillion, right now it's a trillionth of the amount of carbon-12. And you get 10 half-lives, it's just, there's so little of it, you can't measure it anymore. Um, and the other thing is very interesting, carbon-14, because this half-life is so short, if the entire Earth were made of carbon-14, in 100,000 years, there would be no carbon-14 left. Okay? The Earth is not made of solid carbon-14. Okay? And so if you find carbon-14 someplace, that means it has to be less than 100,000 years old. Okay? And, you know, when an organism dies today, the level, you know, is a trillion to one. But before the flood, the ratio was undoubtedly significantly different because there was a lot more carbon-12, which has been buried to become fuel, coal, and all that sort of thing. There used to be a lot more carbon-12 in the Earth. But the other things here will show you that the carbon-14 level is getting bigger. But it, let's say the, the, the pre-flood amount ratio was 1 to 120, you know, one, 128 trillion to 1, okay, which today would be seven half-lives, which would be about 60,000 years. So if that was a level before the flood, if you found something and measured its age immediately right after it died, you know, at the start of the flood, it would look to be seven half-lives or 60,000 years old, okay? So when does the carbon-14 clock start to tick? Well, that's when the animal dies. The organism dies and no longer takes in carbon-14, and the amount of that ratio starts to get different. So what do you need to know to determine something's age with carbon-14? You need to know how fast it decays, the half-life, and you need to know the starting amount of carbon-14, and that is very critical. Now, <laughs> has the current ratio, what the trillion to one, has that always been that, the same? It's very interesting, when carbon-14 was, the name by the name of Libby is the person who developed the carbon-14 dating system. And when he first presented that, there was a creationist who was also a geophysicist, who, an expert in radiometric dating, and he wrote to Libby and says, are you aware, because Libby's assumption is that the carbon-14 level has been always the same. Um, he says, well, are you aware that the level of carbon-14 has been shown to be increasing in the atmosphere? He said, well, you know, I'm aware of that, but it can't possibly be true because it only takes 30,000 years for carbon-14 to reach equilibrium. Uh, and I know the Earth is older than 30,000 years, so it has to be equilibrium. There has to be a mistake. Well, uh, he, he was, so here we, he, he was actually right. It, it wasn't 25% out of, or it wasn't, they thought it was 18 to 20% out of equilibrium. It's actually 25% out of equilibrium. So he was wrong, but he was, you know, not wrong as he thought he was. So anyway, the carbon-14, if the assumption that that level has been the same, then you know, carbon-14 dating is probably reliable or is reasonable. But if that assumption is false, then it's not a reliable dating method. And this is actually a curve that they've, that's been shown, that the rate of carbon-14 increasing in the atmosphere. And it only takes 30,000 years. If you have no carbon-14 in 30,000 years, you get a steady state where the amount of being formed is the same amount being broken down, and it's a level line. But we are on that still steep curved part of the line. So it's, the Earth can't be. So it's that assumption that has been steady is false. And it's 25% out of equilibrium. And that shows the Earth's atmosphere can't be older than 30,000 years. Now, it's very interesting if you take into it, use carbon-14 dating, and you take into account that that carbon-14 is still increasing. You have to, it's more difficult math. You have to use calculus. And I forgot all my calculus, so I don't remember my calculus very well. But when you do that, you actually find that there is nothing that dates older than 60,000 years. Shows that there was a massive extinction 4,500 years ago. What happened then? the flood, 
and that there's been a gradual increase in the number of organisms since that time. So if you date an organism, you date a fossil, you date something, and it has carbon-14 in it, what does that mean? It has to be less than how old? 100,000 years. Is the, oh, if, you know, that's absolute upper limit. But at a current age, you know, with the carbon-14 level today, it has to be less than 60,000 years. Okay? So these are the things that they have dated. They have found carbon-14 in all these things. They found carbon-14 in coal and oil that dates 30 to 50 to 300 million years. Okay, diamonds, 3.5 to 4 billion years. They actually find carbon-14 in diamonds. And diamonds are the hardest thing known. You can't put something into a diamond and contaminate it. Okay, dinosaur soft tissue. We mentioned that earlier. They find dinosaur soft tissue inside of these bones and. Again, these things supposedly date 200 million years old, fossil wood, carbon-14. So carbon-14 is everywhere you look for it, which implies that things have to be less than how old? 60, it's 100,000 years at the absolute upper limit, but 60,000 is the more reasonable. But, th but that doesn't mean that's how old it is. It has to be less than that. And that totally wipes out evolution because it requires billions of years. So, carbon-14 is our friend, it's not a foe. So just remember that. So radiometric, now we're going to be, go I've spent a lot of time on that, I'm sorry about that, but uh, so we're now going to be going a little faster through these things. Now radiometric dating, I could spend hours talking about radiometric dating, but we're only going to talk about it for a few minutes, okay? So radiometric dating, you are, again, you're not measuring the age of something. You're measuring the ratios, like, you know, so you have a parent element that decays into a daughter element, and you are measuring the ratio of those elements. And so the more daughter element you have, that would imply that it's older because it's been changing from the parent to the daughter longer, okay? So these ratios, again, they can be measured extremely accurately but they're not measuring age, again, like in carbon-14. They're just measuring the ratios. And oftentimes you'll see when they're, they're, they say, well, we, rated, we dated this rock and this rock is this old, and they'll show error bars, you know, that the ages have to be between these, these dates. Well, actually, they're not showing, they can't show the actual ages. What they're, those error bars are the accuracy of their measuring the ratios but not the age, okay? So this is, again, an hourglass kind of of, you know, how radiometric, uh, radioactive decay occurs. So you have uranium, uh, uranium-238 decays into lead-206. And it does this through a whole series of steps. Um, and so you, when you look at it, you have the parent, the uranium at the top, the lead at the bottom. And so you have this hourglass sort of thing where uranium is changing uh, into, into lead. And you have to assume, uh, again, the same thing with carbon-14. You're having to assume that that rate that that's dropping from the top to the bottom has been constant. Uh, you have to assume that the, uh, the amount of the original and the amount of daughter in the sample is known. Okay, and you also need to assume that they hasn't changed. Now, uranium is very water soluble. It, it, it gets into water very easily. Uh, and it, it, the earth is covered with what? With water. And so if there's water running over rocks and it gets exposed, it can you know, cause it to lose uh, the uranium. And so again, you know, all of these assumptions are not necessarily valid and all of the assumptions you know, tend to make something look older and not younger. So, now what happens, you know, so let, let's say, okay, radioactive is great. I believe it. We're going to trust it. So science has to do with observation. Isn't that correct? And you can never prove something with science. You can prove something is false 
with science, but you can never prove something is true with science. Does that make sense that people understand that? Um, so you can run all these experiments that show something is was correct, correct, but it only takes one experiment to show that it's wrong. If you get one experiment that shows that it's wrong, it's wrong. Okay? So we're gonna let's put radiometric dating to the test. Okay? And when they do this, they find that the dates are invariably wrong. So here we go. So we have the sunset crater in northern Arizona. They dated it with potassium argon, and they get a date of 200 plus thousand years old. But they know that that rock was formed in 1065. A little bit off. Now, let's see if I can say these words. The, this is Hua La La Le, I think something basalt in Hawaii, was dated at, somebody else can probably say it better than I can, uh, but it was dated to between 1.4 and 22 million years, and it was formed in 1801. Uh, and again, there's this lava flow in New Zealand, I can't say it, um, but with potassium argon dating, it's about 275,000 years, and it was formed in 1949, 1954, and uh, 1975. Then here is this basalt in Sicily, Again, 140,000 years to 350,000 years, the radiometric dating was formed in 1972. And how about Mount St. Helens? Anybody remember Mount St. Helens? So they dated the rocks that, are, that formed in the, in, in the crater, and they got 35,000 to 2.8 million years old. And does anybody here remember Mount St. Helens exploding? Was that 35,000 years ago? I, I may be old, but I'm not quite that old. Okay, and so again, almost always when a rock is dated, it, you know the same rock is dated with the same method or with different method. They get different; it gets different ages. Um, and when the rock is dated by the same method more than one time, they almost again almost always get different ages. And for example, if you have if this was an example where. They've, they found this wood buried in a basalt flow uh, 69 feet below the surface. And with the um, potassium argon, they got 44.5 million year, 45 million years old. With carbon-14, they got 44,000 years old, which is true. Well, actually, neither. Okay, but, but you know, the date should agree, and they don't agree. So how can you have 44,000-year-old rock or wood in a 45-million-year-old lava flow? So radioactive dating isn't accurate when you date a rock of known age. How can it be accurate when you date a rock that you don't know the age? Okay. So therefore, I mean, it's not accurate when you're dating a rock of known age. I mean, there's no way that you could say this is dependable. We test it. It doesn't work. So, volcanoes, we saw Mount St. Helens explode. When a, the volcanoes, every year, all the volcanoes that erupt around the Earth put about a cubic mile of water into the atmosphere and into the oceans. Because uh, most of what that is is a steam cloud that's coming out of the volcanoes. And this is a, this is a volcano in the Philippines. So now think about this. So a mile a year, we're just using you know, uniformitarian assumptions. Okay, that, you know, what's going on today is what's gone on in the past. No, that's not, that's not the case, but let's just, you're using their assumptions. So what does that mean? The oceans have 340 uh, million cubic miles of water in them. Okay? So a cubic mile a year, how many years before the ocean is dry? So 340 million years ago, the oceans, there shouldn't be any oceans. But that was the age of fishes. So how did, how, how did the fishes survive in a desert? Okay. Now, the Earth's population, this is a, this is a fascinating one. Th this shows that the, that it's only been about 45,000 years, or 4,500 years since the flood. Um, so today, the Earth's population is about 8 billion. 
the growth rate, if you have a growth rate of 2%, you could reach the current population of the Earth in 1,100 years, okay? Um, the current growth rate is 9 tenths of a percent. It was 2.8% or 2.08% in 1970, so the population growth is decreasing. But if you have a growth rate of a half a percent per year, it would only take 4,000 years to reach the current population. And if you have a half percent growth rate going on for a million years, which is when supposedly modern humans came on the earth a million years ago, okay, there should be 10 to the 2,100th power. Now that is a big number. Okay. Does anybody have any idea how big that number is? Anybody know how many atoms there are in the universe? Anybody want to guess? 10 to the 80th power. Okay. That's how many atoms in the whole universe. That number is zero compared to this number. Okay. But even so, that's, that's, you know, there, there should be, if, if the Earth's population has been increasing for a million years, there should be so many fossils of dead humans, they should be everywhere, and they're not, okay? And so the Earth's population, just from that growth rate, is compatible with 6,000-year-old Earth. It's not compatible with a million, billion-year-old Earth. And this is another way of looking at the population as well. The world's population historically has been in doubling every 150 years. And that's independent of wars and famine and disease and all that sort of thing. So you start with six people on the ark and you double it, six, 12, 24, 48, you know, da, 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 up to seven billion, eight billion people. That's 30 doubling times. So you double it 30 times. So you have 30 doubling times, 150 years per doubling time, 4,500 years. What happened 4,500 years ago? Noah on, on the ark in the flood, right? So the Earth's population is not compatible with an Earth millions of years old. Now, has anybody ever heard of supernova remnants? This is something I've never heard of. You, good job. You know, people know what a supernova is? <laughs> Somebody tell me, what's a supernova? A star blowing up. That's what a supernova is, okay? So this, these are some pictures of some supernovas. This is a supernova that exploded. First, when a super, you see a supernova because when a star explodes, it drastically increases in brightness. And so yeah, there have actually been supernovas that were so bright you could see them during the day. And so this is one, this, this supernova, this star exploded in 1054. This is a picture of the remnant of it. And there's a, that arrow points to a supernova. This is, this is again, was a, a few years ago. This is Galaxy M100. And this is a supernova remnant. It's called the Kepler supernova, supernova remnant. That this, they saw this supernova to Kepler. Johannes Kepler, you know, one of the great minds of science. Uh, studied the supernova, and this, so this occurred in 1604. Now, supernovas, when they explode, th these, they go through three stages. And there is the first stage, and the first stage lasts about 300 years, and it gets to about seven light years in diameter. The second stage goes from 300 years to about 120,000 years and reaches about 300 light years in diameter. And then the third stage is from 120,000 uh, years to 6 million years and reaches about 1,500 light years in diameter. So those, those are the stages and there should have been, you know, again, the Earth is, if the universe is billions of years old, there should have been lots and lots of supernova remnants. So we're going to put a little table up, okay? So here we have a table. So you have the supernova remnants each stage, stage one, stage two, stage three. And if you look, if, a, if the universe is billions of years old, these are the predictions about how many supernova remnants you should see. If the Earth is 6,000 years old, this is a list of how many supernova remnants you should see. Does that make sense to everybody? Does that kind of make sense? 
So anybody want to guess a ha hazard a guess on what we're going to find when we look at the real numbers? Huh? Somebody's talk up loud. Come on. How close? I would, I, let's, let's make a guess that is really close. You want to make a guess about that? Okay. So here's what you find when you actually look with a telescope. So what is that compatible with? Is that compatible with a universe billions of years old? No, it's compatible with a universe 6,000 years old. So what happened 6,000 years ago? You know, and the amazing thing to me I can't remember if I have a slide, but I'm going to just... There are 7 to the 22nd power, I mean 7 times 10 to the 22nd power, or 76 sextillion stars in the universe. Okay? That's a pretty amazing thing. But you know how, how it talks about that in Genesis 1 on the fourth day? He made the stars also. I mean, like... No big deal, I just, I made the stars. We serve an amazing God. So comets, anybody seen Halley's Comet? Okay, well comets cannot last for millions of years. Every time a comet goes around that tail that you see is the sun burning off some of the material from the comet. And most of a comet is ice. Does anybody, last time I was here, last year I was here, I talked about comets. Anybody remember that? Where did the comets come from? What did I say? Anybody remember? Anybody want to hazard a guess where comets came from? Supernova. No, good, good, good guess, but the wrong. Super comets came from the Earth. You know, again, I believe in something called the hydroplate theory. And there used to be an ocean of water under the crust of the earth. Half, probably half the ocean's water today used to be under a 60 mile thickness of, crust of the crust of the earth. At the start of the flood, what was the first thing that started the flood? What's the very first thing that's mentioned? Huh? Yeah, the fountains of the great deep. Okay? So at the start of the flood, this crust of the earth cracked open. And this water, 60 miles deep, that is superheated, super critical water, it's coming out of there. And it is coming out of there so fast, it's actually going out faster than the escape velocity from Earth. And it's ejecting rocks, it's ejecting all of this water. This water gets out into space, and what does it do? It freezes, becomes comet. You know, they actually have done analysis of comets, and they actually find olivine in comets, and olivine is the only place they know is made in, it has to be made in water, and it's the only place they know it's being made is on the earth. Okay? So anyway, that's, a, that's, a, that's an extra, so you get that for free. <laughs> so comets crumble, crumble, crumble quickly, and every time they go around the sun, they lose some of their mass. Now we have seen several comets break up, you know, I can't remember the name of the one that a few years ago that smashed into Jupiter. Uh, anybody remember the name of that one? I can't remember the name of it. But. So short period comets, comets that have a period or a time that they come around less than 200 years, can't last more than 10,000 years. And there used to be lots more comets. History, they, they, frequently it was not uncommon to see two or three comets at a time. We don't see that. Anymore, So we're losing comets. And so according to evolutionists, comets come from something called the Oort cloud. Now, the Oort cloud, fortunately for science, is so far out you can't see it. You can't find it with telescopes. They don't, you know, it's got to be there because we see comets, but we can't see it. That's perfect, this perfect excuse, right? You know, so... And I like, you know, many scientific papers are written each, each year about the Oort cloud, its properties, its origin, its evolution, yet there's not a shred of direct observational evidence for its existence. But it's got to be there because we see comets. If, we, if it wasn't there, we wouldn't see comets. We see comets, so it has to be there. That's called circular reasoning. I got an F if I tried circular reasoning in college. Um, 
So there aren't any proven source for short period comets. They shouldn't be there unless the solar system is only thousands of years old. Now, the erosion of the continents, uh, Mississippi River Delta. So at the current erosion rate, the comet should, or the, the crust of the Earth should be leveled flat in 14 million years. Now, supposedly there are things that are pushing, you know, stuff up and down. But again, the, the evidence is that it should be eroded flat very quickly. Um, the other thing, there should be a ton of sediments on the bottom of the oceans. It's not there. Now, this is the delta, the Mississippi River Delta. You know, the Corps of Engineers, and we used to call it the Corp of Engineers, but Corps of Engineers, but that's just because we didn't like dams. Um, but they measure, they know how much mud is coming down the Mississippi River because they have to dredge it out every year to keep it passable for boats going up and down the Mississippi. Well, the Mississippi River Deltas, you know, all that material would have formed in about 5,000 years. So the Mississippi River Delta can't be more than a few thousand years old. Dinosaur soft tissue, we talked about that. We're going to show you, this is a picture from you know, dinosaur fossils, okay? You know, there, there's this soft tissue. Actually, it's even, you know, they, they kind of take the calcium out of it. It's still stretchy. You know, they find collagen in it. Collagen doesn't last very long. And here are pictures of red blood cells that they find. The red blood cells are still intact. So... Dinosaurs, and they, every, everywhere they look for it now, the evolutionists don't like to look for soft tissue because it's evidence that it's not very old, but every time, almost every fossil they ever look at, they, they, they find soft tissue in it, showing that the fossils can't be old. This is one of my favorites, the Earth magne Earth's magnetic field, and we all know what that is. The Earth's magnetic field is what makes your compass point to north. They're supposed to. Sometimes in my case it points south. I know it is because that's going pointing the wrong direction from where I want to go. I don't, anybody ever get lost like that? <laughs> um, but the, and the Earth's magnetic field is actually what makes the aurora borealis, the northern lights. You know, the, the, they have these storms on the sun and this, that comes up and the cosmic rays whack into the Earth. And the, and the magnetic field directs all of that up to where I live in the north so it doesn't get you guys down here in the south. I guess this is sort of the south, right? Um, and so the Earth's magnetic field is the process that's been measured the longest. It's been very accurately measured uh, for the longest period of time. Um, and it was initially uh, uh, measured by Gauss, and this was, you know, uh, in the, in, the, in the 1800s. And the Earth's magnetic field is decaying with a half-life of about 1,400 years. And about 10,000 years ago, the magnetic field would have been so strong that life couldn't possibly exist, be stronger than a neutron star. And, and so where does the magnetic field come from? And the best theory that's been developed was, had been developed by a young Earth creationist physicist by the name of Russell Humphreys. And he is amazing. He, he, he is really, truly amazing. Um, and, but what he says, you know, is there's a law in physics that if you have a current flowing and you rotate that current, it creates a magnetic field. Or if you have a magnetic field, and you rotate it, you get an electric current. That's where we get electricity from, right? Yeah, so that's right. So anyway, so Dr. Humphreys, he came up with this idea because it says in, in Genesis chapter 1 that the earth was first made out of what? Water. Because the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. Uh, so he said, in water is a unique molecule, and I, don't know if you, I, I, don't, I should have a picture of it, but you have an oxygen atom like this with two hydrogen atoms on it, but they're not exactly opposite. 
they're sort of angled on one side. They're more on one side than the other. And that creates a positive charge on one side and a negative charge on the other. So if you have all of these water molecules, when God spoke the initial earth into existence with the water, you have all these water molecules lined up, and then you let them go into a random distribution, it would create this massive electric current in the core of the earth. And that core, that current now, would be decaying as a freely decaying current. Uh, the magnetic field kind of helped keep it going, but it's still going to decay. Um, now, the, the, the thing that's very interesting, he, you know, very rarely in science does a scientist make a prediction, says, I believe this is what's going to happen, and it comes to pass. That, is, that does not happen very often. So Dr. Humphreys, before they sent out the Voyager satellites out into space to go to Neptune and Uranus, uh, he made a prediction. He said, based on my idea of the formation of the magnetic field, I predict that this is going to be the magnetic field of Uranus and of Neptune. And the evolutionists, you know, the humanity, you know, they all, all the science, all the astronomers, they all had their prediction, but it was like about 100,000 times less than Dr. Humphreys. Well, guess what, when they got there? I mean, he wasn't even an order of magnitude off. It was, it was like the true number was five, instead he said seven. So, I mean, it was almost exactly on. Um, then he also, Mercury has a magnetic field. Mercury shouldn't have a magnetic field. It's too small, it shouldn't have a current in it, it shouldn't have any of that, it should be dead. But they sent a probe up to Mercury in 1974, and then they sent another one up in 2008. And the one in 1974 measured Mercury's magnetic field. And Dr. Humphrey, again, before the other one was sent up, says, when you send the next probe up, you know, he knew when this one got sent up, he says, when that arrives at Mercury, I predict that the magnetic field is going to decrease by this much. And the Evolutionary astronomers said it's going to be the same. It's not going to decrease. Well, guess what? He again hit it exactly on how much it decreased. Now we're going to talk it. So again, the Earth's magnetic field, the northern lights, when you look up them, that's again evidence of an Earth that's 10,000 years old, no older than 10,000. Now, anybody ever heard of zircons? Zircons are the fake diamonds that you can buy, okay? Those are the kind of diamonds that I can afford, you know? <laughs> um, but it's very interesting, zircons, uranium can just fit into the lattice of the zircon crystal just perfectly. And so zircons glom onto uranium, and there's uranium in zircon. And uranium, when it breaks down from uranium to lead, Go, emits eight helium atoms as it goes down that step. And so these zircons have helium inside of them. Now the thing about helium is very small. It is inert gas. It doesn't react with anything. And it's very, very slippery. It gets out of wherever it is very quickly. You have, you have a, 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 lumen, I mean a helium balloon. How, how long does it last if you have a rubber helium balloon? Like, in a day or two, it's down on the floor, right? That's because the helium is so small, it escapes through the pores. Well, the same thing happens with a zircon. The helium gets, escapes from the zircon crystals. And the warmer that crystal is, the faster it escapes. And interestingly, nobody had ever measured how fast helium gets out of zircon crystals. Nobody had ever done it. They didn't ever think about doing it. So Dr. Humphreys um, 
that. He, he, was, he worked at Sandia National Laboratories where they were doing these deep, deep drill holes. And they, he, they would get these zircon crystals from the granite way deep in the earth. And the deeper you go, the warmer it gets. And so he started looking at these zircons and kept finding all of this helium in it. And so he said, again, I'm going to make a prediction. If the earth is 6,000 years old, this will be the diffusion rate, how fast helium gets out of zircons. If the earth is 4.5 billion years old, this will be the diffusion rate. And so there, we're talking about orders and orders of magnitude different. So he published his predictions in 2001. They sent off this, all the zircons to get analyzed in 2000 and got the results back in 2003 and guess who was right? Okay, so this is a, a graph. This is his graph that he sent that predicted what he thought the diffusion rate would be. So his is the top graph. So his, the, his prediction is the stuff that's in the red as a curve. The evolution of prediction is the bottom graph. Um, and his data, I mean, it fit the data. I mean, you couldn't fit it any better than that. And so again, the fact that there's helium in zircons implies, you know, it, it falsifies the idea of, a, of an old Earth. So, the Earth has to be young. It's less than 10,000 years old. There is a God who created the heaven and the Earth. Sin, disease, death, thorns, thistles, came about because of what? Adam's sin. Evolution is false and is impossible. It's impossible. You know, I mean, I love you, you, If you give an, you, you take a frog and you blender it, okay, and you give it to an evolutionist, you got everything in there you need for life. I mean, you got all the amino acids, you got all the proteins, you got all the lipids, you've got everything needed for life in this little thing right here. Are they ever going to make a frog? Can't. What, what is it missing? It's missing the organization. Where does the organization come from? It has to come from a designer. Okay? I, I, I mean, it's, it, they talk, again, when I was in college, I say they, 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 they supposedly made a few amino acids. I mean, that is like billions of light years away from creating life. It's not even, I mean, it's not even close. Okay, so it, you know that when they you see something, you know, evolution has proven that they can create life. My favorite thing is you, you have a scientist, and he, he's got this multi-million dollar laboratory. He's doing all these experiments, and says, you know, if I can only produce life, I've shown that life can come about without intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, I mean that's what they're doing, but they're they're never ever they're never going to create life. It is not going to happen. It is too complicated, complex. So now we're getting down to the nuts and bolts. Okay? So what happens when I die? We're all going to die. Maybe not. We might get raptured and, you know, and it looking more like that all the time. Uh, but according to evolution, we came from nothing and when we die, we turn to dust and that's the end of it. Okay? According to the Bible, we were created by God. And when you die, it depends on what happens, what your relationship with Jesus Christ is, what happens to you. I don't want the alternative. So what? So mankind has rebelled against the creator God. God loves us, and he died for us. So John 1, 3, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. You know, that, you know, if you ask somebody, what's the first miracle recorded in the New Testament? They usually tell you it's the turning of water into wine, right? This is the first miracle recorded in the New Testament that Jesus, of Jesus. This is his first miracle, creating the universe. Okay? So, Everyone is a sinner. We have sinned against the creator of the universe. 
you need to have Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because he made you, he owns you, he sets the rules. And he is a loving God, a loving creator. And he wants you with him. So I encourage anybody here that doesn't know Christ as their creator to talk to somebody to find out how to have him as your Savior. So that's the end. Well, I guess I'm not too far. Uh, Any questions? I'd be glad to answer any questions. A couple questions anybody has? No. <laughs> I don't admit that. <laughs> no, the, the, I think one of the best points that you've made here towards the end is evolutionists start at the wrong point. How we got here. They don't deal with why we're leaving here. Right. That's, that's it. We're dying. And your last few sentences here is pointed out very clearly. We're dying because of this thing called sin. We're not dying because of evolution. Earth is dying. <laughs> is this information being suppressed by the modern scientists? Yeah. You 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 you, you tell you you tell you tell me. Yeah. What what happened? What's the, what about the science that shows that the Earth isn't warming? Is that being suppressed? Is it in any of our textbooks? No. <laughs> My kids confronted it. When are we going to talk about creation? Oh, we're not going to talk about that. Yeah. So as a teacher, it's really tough. And I always teach evolution. Science has to be true science. It has to be able to be reproduced. It has to be provable. It has to be falsifiable. Falsifiable, okay. So I, what I always tell them, I said, these are all theories. So do not accept everything you're told as fact. Good question. That's what I can do. Did, I, did we get an answer for you? It is being suppressed. Because if if you have if if you're a creationist and you're teaching in a college and that becomes known and you don't have tenure, you're gone, and that has happened many 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 times. If you're a creationist and you come up with you know creation information that you want published, they won't publish it. Okay, these these this information by Dr. Humphreys. You know, you, you actually kind of have to sneak in the back door to get this published. There's, uh, I have a mental block on his name, there's a geneticist that uh, went to Harvard. And, you know, he actually has shown that we're all descended from actually six people, you know, that were on Noah's Ark, uh, six, wi- six wives of, his, of Noah's sons. Uh, I mean, he's, he's published this data about showing that, that, the, that, according to genetics, the Earth has to be young. I mean, he has to do it in a very w- wiggly way, so it's, you know, but the evidence is there if you read it carefully. But again, he, you can't just come right out and say, okay, this shows that the Earth is 6,000 years old. They won't publish it because of what's called peer review. Okay? Peer review means we're not going to publish anything we don't like. Yeah, there's actually two. Um, there's the Answers in Genesis that has their scientific one, and then the creation, the um, creation. No, it's not. I got a mental block. Um, creation Ministries International. Creation Ministries International has a. Uh, a, a, a publication that's a scientific publication comes out three times a year that's peer reviewed, and the Answers in Genesis is on as an online book that's peer reviewed journal. Anything else? I'm probably going to work way over time, but <laughs> I'll hang around for a little bit. Have any questions? Thank you very much. Hopefully, I didn't bore you to death. So, thank you. Thank you.